May this be our prayer. Amen. 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 You may be seated. You know, we're about to dismiss the kids, but before we do that, one of the traditions we have, and I'm going to switch to this mic. Am I on now? Testing. Here we go. So, one of the traditions we have... I Testing works a lot better. One of the traditions we have is uh, about lighting candles when somebody commits their life to Christ. And uh, I was putting it off on the later on the service, just in case, because uh, he happens to work uh, at night, and uh, typically he, c- he couldn't make it this morning. But, uh, but Jose last week uh, committed his life to Christ. And so it's just a... Uh, it's just a cool thing when somebody says, you know, I've, I've done this Christian thing, but it's, it's time that I really commit and just ask Jesus to take my life. And so it's a journey, and uh, it started, and uh, so we just celebrate that and uh, keep Jose uh, in your prayers. And if he comes in, we'll, we'll shout to him later on at the end of the service. So, so kids are dismissed at this time. Hopefully everybody has uh, the handout. If you don't, I have a couple extra up here. Knowing truth in a messed up world. Does everybody have a handout? You need a handout. You might, right in the back. One, One right here. You've got it. Ryan is definitely a lot faster than I am. <laughs> if you want to turn in your Bibles to 1 John 4, 4 through 6, I also have the text here. Um, it's interesting what messages we get from the Lord or in the world. And a lot of times it does get confusing. And I had a friend, and... Uh, he said he went to this hotel, and in this hotel, they had this Chinese restaurant. And his son really wanted a fortune cookie. He was a young kid, and he said, son, let me tell you about fortune cookies. He says, what's there is not true. It may be a good statement. It may be something there, but you never believe what's in the fortune cookie. It's just somebody writing somebody. It's not your fortune. You know, we, we've got God in the scripture, and he teaches us. So really don't even pay attention to it. I mean, if you open it up and read it, that's fine. But just, it's not true. And so he opens it up, and he goes, this is messed up. And he says, why? He says, well, it says, turn this slip in for $5 at the cashier. And his dad goes, oh, no, that's true. <laughs> so, so the son, you got to figure, what is going on, right? I mean, is it true or not true? He just got this whole lecture that it's not true, and now he's cashing it in for $5. And so sometimes we get, get messed up by what we hear. What, what messages are we hearing? What messages are we seeing, Right? What, what, and how do we know what's true? Last week we looked at testing God's spirit. I mean, not God's spirit, but testing the spirit to see whether they are from God or not. And it was a, a really simple uh, test. And I'll get into it when I get the three bullets down a little bit below. But it's actually pretty simple to see if something came from God or not. And today, we're going to take that passage, and, and it's kind of a back-to-back, but just, I just want us to concentrate on 1 John 4, 4 through 6. And it says this, it says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. And when he's talking about overcome them, he's talking about these false prophets, which he calls the Antichrist. And this Antichrist, a lot of times you hear that Antichrist used, 
Uh, the word antichrist is actually only used in 1 John and 2 John. Other times it's referred to the antichrist in Revelation and Daniel as the beast or uh, referenced otherwise. But only in uh, 1 John is it called the antichrist. Uh, and it's against Christ. And again, when we talk about Jesus Christ, Jesus was his first name. Christ was not his last name. That was actually a title. So Jesus, the anointed one, Jesus, the Messiah. So he was Jesus of Nazareth was his name, but his title was Jesus Christ. And so when we get in this passage, he says, little children, uh, you are from God and have overcome them. And he's talking about those antichrists, that spirit. And it, it's also referencing to the power of that spirit. Meaning he says, we've overcome satanic power. Now it's interesting because he says, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Right? So when we ask this question, the question is, who is greater? Is it we are greater? Jesus is greater. So the first thing we got to realize when we look at this passage is it's not that we are greater, but it's that Jesus is greater. And where does he live? In us. Now again, I think that the greatest deception that, that Satan wants us to, to not believe is that he resides in us. That's the most important thing here, and, and Paul screams it in the other passages, but it's like Jesus Christ lives here. God lives here. And a lot of times it's hard for us to fathom because sometimes we're so screwed up that it's hard to believe that actually God could live here in me. But if you've committed your life to Christ and you accept him, you realize that the only way that you're going to make it through this world or is that you've done things wrong, you're separated from God and Jesus died for you and, and you believe that he paid the penalty for you and he came back to life and you go, hey, because I know I'm separated and there's nothing I can do, I can trust in God and he's going to bridge that gap for me. Just like Jose did this last week. It's nothing we can do and then he lives in us. Because he lives in us, and we'll get to this later on in the message, doesn't mean that we're perfect. And this whole thing about 1 John is about walking in the light. And by the way, when you walk in the light, it's not that we won't screw up, it's just that we're walking in a path with him. And if you take a look at this, just real quick, it says, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so it's important to know that he's in us, and he's the one greater, not we are. Common verse that people use is, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Right? How many people have heard that verse? So that next one, Philippians 4.13. So a lot of times when we look at scriptures, we go, oh, we're Christians, so we can do all things through Christ. A lot of times people want to change that just a little bit and say, I can do all things with Christ. Like, oh, he's in me, so therefore I can do all things with him. But that's not what it says. It says, I can do all things through him. And when we're talking about that through him, that means that we're walking in such a way that what we do is through him. Because who's greater? We, are we greater or is God greater? So when we do it, it turns out all wrong. But when we do it through Christ, it makes a difference. And so there's a little bit of subtleness in this, and I think a lot of times we don't talk about it, but we have this, uh, and by the way, here's Jose right there, the candle lit in with it. And, and, and working all night and showing up, it's just awesome. Uh, 
But it's the fact that he strengthens us and, and we do things through him and not on our own. And we'll get to that even more in just a minute. And then he talks about they. You know, who are they? Growing up, my, my parents uh, were with an organization, and, and this guy kept on saying they, they, they. And we go, well, who's they? And he says, oh, those are the people in the garden center at Walmart. You know, so in my mind, every time I hear they, I go, oh, those are the people at Walmart. But this is not the they there. He's talking about the false prophets. He's talking about those who are trying to deceive you are from the world, therefore they speak from the world. And listen to the next one. The world listens to them. Now, the viewpoint here is, and here's another kind of a subtle doctrine thing if you want. Jesus comes from heaven and he speaks heavenly things the world comes from the world and they speak the world stuff and a lot of times every now and then I go how could anybody believe what they're saying I mean it is so ridiculous and they're buying off on it it's because they're from the world that's what we should expect if it's a message from God it's different. And so here it says, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world. That's all they know. They don't know this other part. So when you look at false religions or anybody else, they can't speak the truth because they don't know what it is because they're not from there. So they speak from the world and the world listens to them. Who listens? A lot of times you ever feel like your message is not getting across. Even when we go out knocking on the doors if we ask people it's not hey you know have you heard this and we give them that right away it's like no can we pray for you when we talk about if you're staying here and you're praying pray that God opens eyes because when they see a real God the God who answers prayer it changes things we are not we are from God if you think about that why do you even listen to scripture? Why do you even listen to what God's word is? It's because we're not part of the world. We are part of God. I didn't put it in here, but Ephesians 2 uh, really does a, a thing about who we were and how we were saved uh, from this world, the prince of the, the world, and we were saved out of that. And so he says, they speak of the world, uh, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. And what he's saying there is that here's another test. He already gave us two tests. I'm going to give the bullets the three here. But he says, if somebody is listening to us, and for us interpretation for that, it's us which includes us. Or we're, I mean, it's too written to us. And the us is recorded in Scripture. It's not exactly what I say only if I speak what is in Scripture. It's what Scripture says. And he says, if you're of God, whoever knows God listens to us. That means they, they hear it. They actually hear what it is. You know, sometimes you'll talk to people and they don't hear. It's because they're not from God and they're not listening. They can't listen. A lot of times we want to give scripture to people and say, hey, this is what you're doing wrong or whatever. But they can't hear. Until we ask God to open their eyes. And the spirits start working in their, their hearts so they can, can hear and see. But he's talking about these prophets. And he says, whoever knows, and that knows is, is not just a fleeting, hey, I, I think about God or I know who God is. It's like, if you know God, if you know God, you know uh, whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. So right away, not only do you have one or two bullets here in just a second of the test from last week, 
But the other test is, are they following Scripture? Are they doing what the Bible says? If somebody is not doing what the Bible says and they're giving you advice, don't listen to them. Right? Just don't listen to them. Here he's saying that's pretty, pretty clear. And then he says, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So there's a couple of things that when we kind of look at this just in summary, is number one, that God has overcome. God is all powerful, all right? And a lot of times when we talk about it, I said we can do all things uh, through him who strengthens us. But this comes with power. If you were to look at 2 Timothy 1.7, for God gave us, that means if you know Jesus Christ, he gave you a spirit, uh, uh, gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. So three things, power, love, and self-control. So when we, when we have the spirit, it comes with power. I think that's the number one thing he says, and I think that's the number one thing that we don't identify with the most. And I say that, 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 20, says, for the kingdom of God does not c consist of talk, but in power. So why do I say that? Paul in 1 Corinthians is talking to the church there, and there's some people saying that they're all Christians, and they're doing all this stuff, and they're, they're you know, and, and Paul says, look, when I get there, I'll see the power of God working. And if it's not working, these people who are saying that they're all part of the kingdom, because the kingdom comes not with just talk, but with power. And so Paul knew that when he went to that church, he'd be able to see whether that power was there or not. This power is a reality of the Christian walk. And a lot of times people say, well, why do I do what I do? And it's like, because it's the reality. If, if there was an answered prayer, if God didn't work, then we're wasting our time here. When we can pray and see God intervene in our daily life, in the lives of others, you see his power. Think about the Lord's Prayer. A lot of times we'll say the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come. You ever realize what you're asking for? You're not asking, hey, I want these people to know who you are. You're asking that your power come down. And we want to see your power in our lives, in this church, in our neighborhood. We're not asking God to just, you know, reveal himself, except in the sense of, we're asking for his kingdom to come, which comes with power. As we pray, as we surrender, we see more of his power. This is the way it works. I did list in the handout some areas where we've overcome. I'm not going to go into that. So he says, you have this power. And, and remember where he's talking about this. If we went to 1 John 3, he's talking about answered prayer. He's, he's talking about God's power working. And, he's, and he just, it's a real quick thing. He says, hey, by the way, somebody's speaking differently. Test the spirit. <clears throat> Why? And here's the blanks. I know Gretchen is here, so I had to make sure I got to fill in the blanks. <clears throat> False prophets come <clears throat> from the world. They speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. So the truth tester, I had last week, I had some meters and different things. <clears throat> Number one from this week, see if the spirit or person listens to God's word. This is how we know what truth or deception is. So when you hear somebody speaking and their life doesn't match up, that should be an instant 
thing that you go, I'm not going to listen to that person. People seek advice from a lot of different people, a lot of different things. Some even from fortune cookies. But what this is saying is that if they're not living their life for Christ, you probably shouldn't listen to them. Now, we're not all perfect. We're on the, on the path. About six months ago, God says, Tom, I've given you a spirit of power, of love, and self-control. <clears throat> he says, you know, you do all right in the power thing. You do okay in the love thing, but this self-control thing, now you need to fix this, and this is an area in your life that you've got to work on. And I go, <clears throat> God, I think I'd like some other things to work on. But I'm walking in the light, and he says, no, I think, I think this is it now. And so about six months ago, I go, okay, God, I, I'm definitely overweight. And that really shows a lack of self-discipline. And I said, I'm going to give that to you. And so I started on a journey. It's been a slow journey. And I'm not here to give accolades except to God. But I think I'm down. Most of y'all probably wouldn't see it because I was so overweight. But I think I'm down to like 39 pounds over the last six months. But I tried a lot of different things. But when God says, I've given you the power to do this. I talk to people, I say, hey, don't, don't do drugs or don't do this because God can help you. And God says, okay, I can. I'm like, God, that's for the drug people. <laughs> Not the food people. <laughs> And God says, no, it's for the food people. And uh, I said, all right. And Carolyn can tell you that for years I kind of, eh. But it's God going, no. Either my power is real and you have power in you and you can do it or it's all fake and it's a lie. And I go, God, your power is real. I see, I, I ask. And, and a lot of times God brings things to you at the right time, meaning I see people getting delivered. I see God just working in people's lives. And then God will reveal something about you. And God says, you need to change. And so... One is, listen to people who are listening to God. My life, I am not who I am, was five years ago. I tell people this, you wouldn't want me here 20 years ago. Or 25. Maybe last week, I don't know. But one, don't listen to people who don't listen to God. And Joshua, I think I found that the problem is still coming from this headset. I think that's where the noise, nope. So number two on Truth Tester, see if the spirit or person proclaims that Jesus is the Christ. That's a real simple one. And again, not his last name, Jesus Christ, but Jesus is the anointed one. He is the one from heaven. And by the way, tr true, uh, oh, what, coming truth here. Last week I, I used, uh, it was a, I think it was a part of a preposition phrase that says if he's, he's from God. And uh, actually in context of last week, that's, that's not a true, it's a true statement, just not from that context from last week. But when we say that Jesus is the Christ, it means that he is the anointed one. He came from God. 
When we look at the book of John, Jesus would say, uh, we looked at that last week, ego amin, which means I am, which is a referring to God of Abraham in the burning bush where he says, I am. And in the book of John, Jesus is, keeps on referring to himself as the I am, the anointed one. And so those who acknowledge that he is the anointed one, not somebody else that came down and was a substitute or, or some Michael the archangel or some of these other things that people want to say, he came from heaven. And see if the spirit or person proclaims that Jesus came in the flesh. And by the way, sometimes this is blatantly easy and uh, we don't talk about the spirit world a lot of times, but it is there, and it is out there, and we see it all the time. And again, uh, a lot of times, as Carol and I were discussing this, a lot of times I'll, I'll ask, can you tell me that Jesus is Lord? Meaning, is he the Christ? Is he the one? Is he Lord? And a lot of people will say, well, he is the, the Son of God. Just kind of a statement. And I'll say... No, what I'm saying is that, is Jesus Lord? Is Jesus Christ, is he the anointed one? Is he the one that you're going to follow underneath? And you will see people get upset and just not profess that. And they'll get upset and they'll leave. And I gave the illustration for those who weren't here last week. I was talking to somebody and, and I, I asked that question and, and they gave me a just an answer. I asked him again, and God was like, you better step back. And I stepped back. I took two steps back, and the person just looked at me and says, I feel like hitting you. And I go, good call, God. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, so those three things, how do we know it's truth in this world? Go by those three things, and really, you know, God's word is going to teach you. And he says, if you know Jesus Christ, his spirit is going to teach you. If you think I'm teaching you anything today, you're wrong, because it's his Holy Spirit that teaches. He teaches us. So the question comes, and a lot of times we get into this, it, this is easy, but it's like, how do we get God's word? How do we know what's true? How do we... How do we live in truth? Because this seems pretty simple. And a lot of times we look at the context of 1 John and we go, what, what is this? And he actually has covered what I'm going to cover next. But it's like, how do I live in the truth? And you have to ask your, yourself this question. Who do you listen to? Who do you listen to? I mean, that's a big deal. I see people, they'll be all happy, and then they'll, they'll be sad, and, and it's like, hey, what's happening? It's like, well, somebody didn't like my thing, you know, my post, and they said this nasty thing. I'm like, do you know who that is? No. Are you one of your friends? No. Who are you listening to? And you have to ask yourself that question, but let's take it a little bit deeper than that because I think in the Christian realm, we don't really take it any deeper than that. And let's ask a question because a lot of times we get all spiritual, but on this is, is can a Christian, and that's the blank, can a Christian listen to the world and not God? And when we say the world, not only is it those in the world, but also the spirit that is in the world, which is Satan, right? That's the question. Can we listen to that? Should we? But the answer, the first one is can we? Because I've seen a lot of people say, well, I'm a Christian. I don't listen to that. I'm a Christian. But when you think about this, who are you listening to? And it's easy to see how easy... Satan gets into our lives. If I look at number one, 
Number two, this is from Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. I kind of like it. And I just re put it right here. Because listen to these. These are four things that he identified in that series. And if you're interested in that series, let me know. But identify if the enemy is at your table. Number one, you're entertaining the idea that it's better at another table. And the context that he's setting that is, is that God says, hey, I want you to walk in the light and this is how you should live. And what you're doing is you're thinking, hey, it's better off or the other things look a lot better. And so I'd rather do these other things than what God wants us to do. When you start hearing that, you know that you're listening to the spirit of this world. When you find yourself thinking you are not going to make it. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I'm not going to make it. There's, there's times I, I would think I would um, be immune to that. But I'd be doing something. And I'm, I look up and I go, Man, I'm not going to make it. And God says, no, you're going to make it. Carolyn goes, uh, don't forget, you're going to make it. And, and again, I just bring that up because sometimes it's not that you listen to Satan all the time. It's that you listen to Satan at the wrong time. A lot of times we go, we're Christians and therefore I'm immune to this. Man, Satan wants to get right in there. This is the third one. This is a powerful one. You, um, you are hearing you are not good enough. You are not good enough. I don't know how many times I've heard that in the last week, in the last month, in the last year. People just go, I'm not good enough. And, they, and, they, and the answer to that is, you're not by yourself, but through Christ you are. God, God made you. He, he fastened you. He, he designed you. He made you his workman, workmanship. Ephesians 2.10, he designed you. When you say you are not good enough, Jesus died for you. If Jesus died for you, you're good enough. He thought you were good enough to die for. Number four, you are starting to think that everyone is against you. When you know when you think everybody's against you, you see people talking about, oh, they're against me. When you think everybody's against you, and I'm not saying there are some people against you. Could be, real. Right? I, I know a couple of people against me. I've been in the corporate world. There's been people against me, right? But when you start to think everybody's against you, Satan has you. He has you. We are anointed. If you want to flip over the third thing, is to take action. My goal this morning is not just to go, hey, how do you know the spirit of truth, spirit of error, but also how do we listen to what we need to listen to? See, when we're from God, if we think about that, who has the right to talk to us? Who has the right to, you know, say things about us. It's God, right? He has ownership. If you're walking down with your child and somebody says, you know, your child's name is Pete, but I'm, today I'm going to name him uh, George. So you need to call him George from now on. Would you listen to that person? Why? Because you're his parent? What happens, if, what happens if he says, you know, George should be a uh, horse jockey or he should be this? Should we go, oh, we should devote his whole life? What happens if they say, oh, George, he's not good enough? Does that person even know him? Who, who, who has the right to speak in that person's life? The parent. 
And this chapter is saying, hey, we're from God and we got to understand our relationship. And I don't really care what other people say about you. Don't even listen to them because it's ridiculous. If they called you George and your name was Pete. So we need to listen to what God says. So ask yourself these five questions. And be honest with yourself. And this is kind of the take action. A lot of times I call this, so what? We have this message and it's like, well, so what? What do we do with this message? Ask yourself this first question. Is my walk with God just talk? Or does it come with power? Does my walk with God just talk or does it come with power? Defining power is when we walk with him, he has things for us to do and and we see God's work in a mighty way. And you bear fruit. It's just the result. You just, it happens. Not we do it, God does it through us. So ask yourself, be honest. Is my walk with God just talk or does it come with power? And I will say this, it doesn't come with rededication. It doesn't say, hey God, I promise you I'm going to do better next time. I'm going to promise you. What it talks about is surrender. and saying, God, I, I need to surrender to you. The next one is, who am I listening to? Again, pay attention to what goes in. What, it, what are you feeding yourself and what you're thinking yourself? Because however a man thinks, so he is. You get around toxic people, it's because they have toxic stuff going into them. You hang around toxic people, you start getting that toxic into, into your life. You just need to not listen to them. Who are you listening to? Number three, have you been listening to a lie? A lot of times we think that <laughs> we're not good enough or what do we do now? And, and a lot of times, I put this, this down here, uh, this truth and prayers and also condemnation versus conviction. Because there's a lot of truths in scripture and maybe you just want to go, hey, this week I need to look at the truths about me. And then the other thing is there's conviction and condemnation. If you know Jesus Christ, he says, there's no condemnation for you, only conviction. And by the way, a lot of times people still live with guilt. And they say, hey, I I turned it over to Christ, but really what they're living in is this condemnation circle. They're saying, oh, I screwed up. I'm going to do it again better. I'm going to, and no, what God says is that's conviction. You pray, you give it to him, and you surrender, and you're forgiven, and you move on. We need to be looking forward not backward. How many people have screwed up in the past? How many times I wish I wouldn't have said what I needed to say? You know, I'm the first one there. God designed our bodies. I I don't like this sometimes. But we feel, if you study the brain, we feel before we think. Just the way God designed us So when something happens and we see something, we want to come out, and that's why the Bible says be slow to speak. Why? Because you have to let your brain catch up with you. Sometimes it doesn't matter if your brain catches up with you because you put all this wrong thinking in there. And so we react. But if you know Christ, you should be thinking about right things and give you that second to go, what I feel, what am I thinking? And this conviction, again, we just need to not condemn ourselves, but be free. God wants us free. He came that we might have life. And if you're tied up in guilt and addictions and lack of self-control, you feel captured. Or maybe there's things that you just need to let go in your life or you're broken. Who you've been listening to, I, I encourage you, if you deal with this, just kind of work through even this truth and prayer and this conviction, uh, condemnation versus conviction. 
ask for wisdom. You know, if we're walking in the light, and I say that a lot of times people say, well, I'll ask for wisdom and God will give it to you. That's not exactly true. The Bible does say that, but in James 1, it's like if you're thinking, hey, I'm living halfway in the world here, or halfway in the world here and halfway with God, God says, doesn't matter what you ask for, you're not going to get it. Am I walking in the light and not according to the light? And what that means is a lot of times people say, well, if I go to church, check. If I read my Bible, check. If I pray, check. And they go, I'm a good Christian now. That's kind of walking according to the light. When you've got Christ in you and you go, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to surrender, and you're walking, you may read your Bible, but it's not a check. It's because you want to know who he is. You want to pray because there's power and authority. If you haven't experienced that, when you start asking God because you're, you're walking and, and you see him move in people's lives, you stand in awe. And so are you walking in the light? And that's a question you ask yourself. And again, I think that comes down to surrender. I'm going to ask the worship team just to come forward. There's five reasons at the bottom there why I don't have answered prayer. One is we love the world or the things in the world. It's like, you know, I, I, this Christian stuff, it might require me to lose weight. It might require me to give up some things that I don't want to give up right now. Maybe you don't know who child you really are this morning. You go, I want to know for sure. Maybe we don't understand, like I said, that we're his child. Maybe we've been deceived about who the anointed one really is. Maybe we have sin in our lives. That we either don't want to deal with it, we know it, but we want to justify it. So many times people just want to justify sin and, and uh, they say, oh, it's okay. I'm just going to pray to God, God, because I'm one of his chosen ones. And God says, that's not how it works. If you got sin in your life, and like I said, there, God deals with us each individually. God came to me about my weight. There's other things that God just, uh, over time, God says, okay, it's time for you to deal with this. And if I don't deal with it, that's sin. We don't love our brothers and sisters. Not just, hey, how are you doing, but love. I pray this morning, whatever is in your life, if you're not free, that you go, I want to be free this morning. If you look at that and right where you are and you go, hey, I want to make this decision. That's between you and God, and, and I encourage you to do that. And maybe it's a path. Maybe you go, God, I don't know what this looks like, but I'm going to head in this direction, and we want to be here to help you. And uh, there'll be those who will pray with you. I'll ask Ryan and Laura. If, where's Laura? Also, if y'all would come up. If you want somebody to pray with, you can pray. If you want to come to the altar, the steps here and just pray. You want to pray right where you're at. This is a time where we give ourselves to God. Father, I thank you for each one here. Father, I, you came that we may have life, that we may be free. Father, may that be true. May we not walk out of here not free. Father, may we make a decision today to follow you. Father, may those who know you go, man, I, I need to get my shopping cart full and I need, I want to see more of you in my life and more of you working. Father, I thank you that you continue to work on me. Father, uh, thank you. Father, I pray for each one here that they would come to you. Father, if they were walking in the light, it may be a time of praise and, and just thanksgiving. It may be a time where they can pray for others who need this. Father, I ask.
ask this in your son's name. Amen. I'm going to sing, Lord, I need you.